Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the High Performance Zone. Gucci here. Today, I have Michelle Mace Curran. Let me tell you, lead solo pilot for the Thunderbirds. And Gucci and Mace get into a really cool conversation. Uh, I think early on, you're going to see some of the technical jargon, the inside, behind the scenes, uh, two solo pilots talking about a craft. Uh, there is some slight differences between the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels, but a lot of similarities. Uh, the other thing we get into is the, the real heart and soul, the mission of the team, uh, Mace uh, being only the fifth woman to fly with the Thunderbirds. What's really cool is in the first uh, lead solo that's uh, on the left wing, and that's an inside situation. The left wing is the harder of the two. And, uh, and we talk all kinds of really cool stuff, but the way she inspires others, the way uh, we talk about uh, making a difference in people's lives. And really, if you're into aviation, you want some inside stuff, it comes loud and clear here. So I enjoyed it. Uh, lots of... Uh, that's some inside stuff. All right, here we go. As we say in the solo world, ready, hit it. Hey, everybody, I can't tell you how excited I am to have Michelle Mace Curran. Okay, now, wait a minute. This is lead solo pilots, Thunderbirds, Blue Angels, talking to each other. Uh, Mace, you, uh, I just want to say thank you for uh, being here, wearing the glad to be here shirt. Glad, glad to have you. Absolutely. I'm super excited uh, to be here. It's a unique conversation that we get to have coming from similar perspectives, but in two different services. So I think we're going to have a lot of cool stories to share with each other. Well, I'm glad you went right to the stories because that's what, you know, that's what people want to hear. And uh, I know you got a ton. I got a ton. And I'm going to learn a lot because uh, as much as the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds, we do interact and we'll talk about that. Um, there's nuances and there's differences right and a lot of similarities a lot of nuances uh first off though i just want you know let our audience know you just finished your three-year tour with the thunderbirds right and so um what was uh, I, I know i have i get asked this question all the time what was one of your biggest memories uh from being on the thunderbirds yeah, so I was on the team from the 2019 through the 2021 uh, season. Uh, I'm sure we'll get more into that, but the pandemic ha happened right in the middle. So that uh, changed a lot of things. There's so many things that were memorable. Um, the two things that stick out the most are my very first flight for the public yeah. was the Super Bowl flyover. Yeah. Was it? Very first one in 2019. Um, so we had just come together as a Delta and obviously millions of people saw that. So that was amazing, but very stressful. And then- And, and that, um, that, hold on, real quick. what position were you that year? So I was number six at that time, yep. the opposing solo, but I flew yep. on the left wing for all three years. So I am the furthest aircraft out on the left. We stay on either the left side or the right side uh, yeah. the entire time, whether you're six or five. You see, that's a nuance that um, I didn't know, honestly. Um, and I, and we'll talk more about it. Um, on the blues, we switch. Uh, number six is on the right wing and then moves to five on the left wing. But you got, you all stay the same. And I, I bet you there's a lot of advantage to that. We should talk, we should talk more about that. Um, but the Super Bowl, okay, tell me, uh, what was the debrief? Did it look good? Were, were you guys balanced? Is everybody balanced? Yeah. So when we passed over the stadium, everyone was in perfect formation and our boss who was new at the time as well. So his first event, yeah. uh, and he's obviously responsible for setting the timing. Um, he like shacked it. So it was nice. awesome. And then of course we make a pretty aggressive right turn and I'm on the left wing. Yeah. So as you probably know, it's hard to stay with that initially. It takes a lot of practice. So I get just a little bit deep in that turn. And it's so obvious to me and the blimp follows us through that whole turn and it's all on TV. And I'm just like, Oh no. But everyone I talked to was like, you guys looked amazing. So I think, you know, we noticed stuff that other people don't. Oh, great. Now a couple of inside comments were being made here is the idea of shack. Okay. So a shack, everybody is when you put a bomb right through the shack on, uh, the, uh, um, the training rounds, but the point is you're right on time, right on target. It's perfect. And uh, as you, you know, Mace, that's not easy to do, especially when a million people, you're sitting the Star Spangled Banner, you're supposed to fly over on the last note and bam, you guys nailed it. Yeah. And what people don't realize is a lot of that falls on the singer and their timing yeah. consistency. So you do a rehearsal and 
you time exactly each line of the national anthem and how quickly it should be happening. And then you have someone on the ground, you know, that's timing it and they're like, oh no, they're nervous and they're singing faster or <laughs> they're getting really flowery with their notes and it's taking longer, like pull it back or push it up, which is pull the throttle back or push the throttle up to get yeah. faster or slower. And yeah, so there's a lot of moving parts, everything from broadcast commercials and invocations and everything that go into those live events. So it's pretty cool when you actually nail the timing. Who's on the ground for you all? Is it number seven, eight? Who really is, is in charge of the communication? Yeah, so seven and eight work together. Uh, seven primarily owns that. He's the director of operations. Um, and so he's the one that's up with the broadcast company and on the radio with us. And then eight, the narrator is usually there running around coordinating other things. So they're both on the rooftop of the stadium normally. So, so that's another nuance on the blues. Seven's the narrator, but also has the role of really assistant ops on the ground, making it, making it happen. And then uh, as you know, I think, you know, seven and our team moves up into the demo and I'm not sure that's normal for you. Right. Or is it? it it's not. No. So yeah. normally uh, seven stays the director of operations the entire yeah. time that they're on the team, but number eight, um, normally it's just the narrator and advanced pilot. So also in our case, an F-16 pilot, um, but they kind of do act as like an additional director of operations a lot of times since they're the only one there representing the team ahead of time. Um, but this year, kind of a new thing, um, the number eight pilot that was hired is actually going to stay on the team for three years and then transition into a solo, probably a solo position. Um, after that. And I think that's one of the things that we picked up from working closely with the Blue Angels was just that continuity there uh, that helped. So that was, that was a change that was just made this current season. Oh, wow. See, I didn't know that. We're going to learn so much. Um, and do you think that'll stay as a norm, as a pr procedure, or do you think it's a one-off? I think it'll probably stay. I think the biggest concern about it was the ask of keeping someone on the team for three years okay. just because the schedule is very demanding. So it's normally a two-year assignment for the officers, um, but people th of the applicants were really anxious to apply for that position and they were excited about three years. So obviously yeah. they don't know all the ins and outs yet when they're applying, they haven't experienced it firsthand, but as long as that doesn't end up being a factor, I would guess it will stick around, but it's kind of, this is a test case to see how it goes. But I, I know it's going to go well. And the person that got hired is number eight is really excited about it. And he's awesome. And he's going to crush it as in both positions. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I, I don't know if you know, but I was uh, seven, six, five. So I got the three-year tour on the blues. And uh, when we apply uh, for the, for the blues, you don't know what position you're applying for. Uh, it, you're just on the team. And then after we select, let's say the three pilots for that year, uh, then in that process of about the next six weeks, uh, it's, you know, it's determined who gets the seventh spot, which means it's a, it's a pro and a con. The pro is you get three years. I saw that as a pro because, you know, you get an extra year on the team. Uh, the con is that you're not flying in the demo for the first year, you know, um, but our seven does all the media rides. So it's kind of like your eight. So we're, we're talking the same thing. Um, and I actually enjoyed that tour. It's one of my favorite favorite tours, knowing though that I was going to fleet up, right? And uh, and it's interesting is that you don't know if you're going to go to the solos or the diamond, and you don't know that for the entire year. Uh, that's not decided towards the very end when we've actually selected the new pilots, and uh, we can go into how the blues determine if you become a solo or a diamond pilot. But um, how is that done on, on the T-Birds? Do you know what position you're uh, going to fly based in the selection process or not? So you find out when you get told that you made the team. So it sounds really? like a little bit earlier than you guys do. Um, when you're applying, you know which positions are opening up the following season. Okay. And it's usually, you know, three pilots in the demo are going to be new. So of the six jets, three will be flown by new pilots. Um, so, you know, you know, a left wingman, um, the boss, and one of the solos, which for us is our, the opposing solo. I think it's the same, is okay. um, the new person. And so you, we do ask in interviews, if you got to rank the positions, like this is not, oh. we're not going to hold this against you. Like we legitimately want to know what people are drawing to. Cause I think it does reflect their personality and their yeah. style a little bit, whether they want to be part of the diamond, which is more graceful and you're always together as a team. 
the solos are constantly working as a team, but you're flying single ship a lot. So um, it's a lot more aggressive flying. So it was, it's always interesting to see what people say is their preference. Um, and then, you know, number eight is kind of its own little thing. Like, do you want to be responsible um, going cross country by yourself on a regular basis, flying to the show sites the day before the rest of the team arrives, you know, taking all the logistical challenges that come with that. So yeah. yeah, we do ask what people want. They don't always get what they want, yeah, yeah. but sometimes we, once we get to know them, we realize their personalities are going to fit better yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. Um, but we do tell them what position they're being hired into when we tell them they make the team. Okay. So um, we're going to dive into what was your answer when you got asked that question? I said, I wanted to be a solo. That was my first choice. And why? I liked the idea that you get to do both. And yes. I, I think I like the freedom that comes with, you know, getting to do the high G maneuvers and the really rapid climbs and just max performing the aircraft. Yeah. But then you also get to fly in one of the more difficult formations in the entire time when the whole Delta is together out as an outrigger trying to loop and roll, you know, when you're on the end of the whip uh, is challenging. So to be able to do both of those things was, was just super cool. And I thought flying upside down would be awesome. Uh, turns out it is pretty cool. So I'm, I'm glad I went with that. And I think it ended up being a good fit. That's so, I mean, you and I are a lot alike. We're going to talk more about that, but that was my feeling too. Uh, I wanted to be a solo bad, um, just mostly because of the maximum the performance aspect, but also the idea of, hey, we get to do both, you know? Uh, in fact, I don't know if it's true on, on the Thunderbirds, but on the Blues, the solos, we joke a lot about not having to fly formation you know we we right. actually yeah our joke is a perfect air show is uh right after the solos routines is done and you're about to go to delta the boss's airplane breaks and you gotta land you know but it's a joke but that's uh what what's the feeling on the thunderbirds tell me the inside scoop between the diamond and the solos oh it's it's totally the same we obviously work really well together but there's yeah. a friendly like rivalry yeah. uh there and we always say uh that the solos are loved by millions, hated by four. Ah! <laughs> so that's kind of like our running joke. Um, I but like that. We got some diamond appreciation time when um, we kicked off those flyovers that we did yes. during the pandemic. Yes. We flew in Delta formation for way longer than we had ever done as solos, much less really anyone. Wow. We, we flew it. It was insane. <laughs> My arm would go numb and I was like, yeah. is it still there? Okay. We're still flying. Uh, yeah. So that gave me more of appreciation for what they do. It's, it's definitely challenging. And I mean, my neck was real stiff after those flights. Oh man, we're going to dive into more of those. I want to know about the pandemic, the flyover, but I'm actually going to focus back on, cause I didn't give you a chance to finish your second memorable uh, part. Okay. You, you talked about the, the flyover and, and other two little inside comments that were made. The Delta for everybody is when all six jets get together. So diamonds four, solos are two, we get Delta. And when you said you went deep, why don't you explain what that means in that term? Yeah. So if the, the perfect formation, if you can imagine that, um, obviously we're rotating in three dimensions. So you can't say really up or down, um, but if everyone was flying level, straight and level, um, deep would be the equivalent of down. So more uh, downward <laughs> uh, movement in position. It's hard to explain without a visual. Yeah. Um, but then okay, you know, as you a have, fighter pilot, which you are too, you're using your hands. Oh, we yeah. all use our hands. Keep going though. I love it. Yeah. So you always have forward and aft. That wouldn't make sense no matter if you're upside down, rolling, whatever. Um, but then width is another thing we talk about. So if this is the jet you're flying off of and this is perfect formation, obviously moving wide would be further away or tight would be closer. Uh, and then depth is this up and down. And we use that term, whether you're rolled you know, sideways or upside down, or in my case, making a right turn over the Super Bowl stadium. And you have to, as that outrigger, so right, if this is the boss, then there's another jet and then there's me, um, you have to match that pull rate as they start to turn perfectly because they're turning away from you. And if you're just a little bit behind, uh, you'll end up a little bit deep, which is what happened to me at the Super Bowl and was seen by millions. First off, let me see your watch, man. You're, you're, what kind of watch are you wearing? Uh, I just got it. Young Hans. Oh, it's I literally got this like 
three days ago. No so like, kidding. No kind it is. Oh, nice. I thought it was one of the bright lean. Um, did you guys get bright leans? I know we did. So we've been trying to put an order together. Uh, yeah. They didn't do one while I was on the team. Honestly, all of the Breitling aviation watches are just really big for my wrist personally. Yeah. Yeah. So I've never really, as cool as they are to have, you know, your patch or the silhouette yeah. of the aircraft on them and a great, you know, memento to keep. I was like, it's hard for me to justify spending that much when I'm not going to actually wear it. Cause it, right. I mean, it makes my wrists look like a child's. So <laughs> I wish they had some smaller ones that aren't like the tiny women's ones that are yeah. the size of the quarter. Cause I don't want that either, but I think I'm, I'm in between watch, watch stuff. My husband's a big watch enthusiast. So he's been trying to convince me to get into it. I will be honest. I normally wear an Apple watch. <laughs> there you go. And for health reasons or why? Yeah, I just really into fitness and knowing like how much I'm moving and I, as annoying as they are, I like the little reminders being like, Hey, you have to close your move rings. And I, I get satisfaction in seeing the numbers on there. Hey, me too. You know, it's, it's like, I, maybe it's the aviation background. Uh, I know on the carrier, you know, we have what we call the greenie board. I don't know if you're aware of that. They, they, they um, measure every landing and we put a, uh, uh, a graph up in the, in the ready room has your call sign and every landing is graded, but it's like you're in kindergarten, you know, you get different color um, circles for the grade. So uh, if you're a 4.0 uh, would be an okay, it's green. 3.0 is yellow. That's fair. Uh, 2.0 is a no grade. That's, you know, usually orange and a wave off's red. But the point is that mentioned, you know, you like seeing stuff like in the Apple watch. Uh, I remember walking in the ready room and, uh, two things happen. First off, it's very clear who's performing well and who's not. Now that's, it's only grading landings, but that typically is the hardest part of the, uh, of the carrier aviation. But the other cool part is that you're all up there, you know, and uh, it's a great way to um, build a little bit of a uh, competitive competition, collaborative competition. Did you have any of that in the Air Force? Uh, not something quite like that, but Definitely, as far as grade books, tracking everything through every upgrade and, you know, just the debrief culture of talking about everyone's mistakes, regardless of who it was that you're flying with. Yep. And it's super uncomfortable at first, especially when you're new to the community, because you feel like everyone's judging you. But then you <laughs> rapidly realize that if they're making the same mistakes, they're getting they're held to the same standard. So it's not like you're being hazed because you're new you're probably not as good because you're new. So you're highlighted more often, um, but it, it just makes you a lot better. So I totally get why they did that. And I cannot tell you how many people have asked about whether I've landed on a boat. That is one of the oh. most common questions I get. Is it? And, I wasn't even going to yeah. ask you that because I know the answer. <laughs> right. It's just not something we do in the Air Force. And the right. F-16 is definitely not taking a hook. Um, yeah. Our gear is not nearly as robust um, and not made for that, but I appreciate the challenge that that must come with that, especially at night when the uh, seas are rough, I can only imagine. But people ask me that all the time. They're like, oh, Air Force pilots, they don't even land on boats. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> well, I wasn't right. going to rip you on that. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe later on. But, you know, the F-16, I, I think you're aware of this, flew, against, flew off against the F-18 when both services were looking for uh, you know, a strike fighter, single seat strike fighter. And uh, the F-16 won, by the way, the competition. Um, Air Force bought that. And then the Navy said, you know, uh, and by the way, it flew off against the YF-17. And the Navy said, you know, we need some modifications, a la two engines for, you know, at sea and all that crap. But um, for obvious reasons, I know you know this, but for the public, um, the F-16, it's lighter. The landing gear, as you mentioned, it doesn't have to be as robust. That makes it lighter, makes it, you know, more thrust to weight efficient. A lot of good advantages to that airplane where the Navy, you know, says, hey, we got to take on some extra weight. Um, blah, 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 blah. So um, same mission, but different um, constraints around it. Uh, did you ever get a chance to fly the F-18 or any other airplanes besides the 16? Uh, I got to ride in the back seat of mm. um, the Blue Angels, number five. Uh, oh, you Mr. did? B. I did, yeah, in 20, I think 2019 um, oh, or nice. early 2020. So I got to ride, which is interesting because no G-suits, right? I feel like we have right. so much to talk about. We keep parlaying yeah, go into more, more stuff. Um, so I got to ride for a whole uh, high show practice in his back seat. 
and no G suit, which I pull nine G's on a regular basis, but I wear a G suit. I have an A tags G suit. So uh, it's like, you know, a full set of snow pants is almost what they look like, but they're full of air bladders. And when you pull G, they inflate, squeeze your legs to help push the blood back up to your head. Uh, and I didn't realize how cued my muscles that you flex to help with that were to the G suit. Like that was the thing that in my subconscious made me G string correctly. Yep. And I had such a hard time doing it without that cue of the G suit inflating. And I think it's a lot like lifters, like weight lifters, they learn to cue off of certain things, or if they have, you know, a lifting belt, they're able to like brace against that. And if you always lifted with that belt and then you took it off and you went to lift, uh, it was tough. Like yeah. you just, your those muscles aren't turned on. So who I was working my butt off just to stay conscious and you guys don't even pull as much G's as we do, but it was still a workout. I really appreciated, uh, the demands that it puts on the body without a G suit. So people ask about that a lot too. You know, like, why do you fly with G suit? Why, why don't they, or is that different? Who pulls more G people are always looking to compare the two teams and be like, this one is clearly better. Uh, they're just so different. Um, so I try to explain some of the differences usually when people ask about that, but it was really cool to see the profile from the backseat. I enjoyed it. Oh man, that's awesome. I never got to ride in a Thunderbird uh, backseat. I, I got to do an F-16 ride, but it was tactical. And um, I often I wanted to do that uh, for myself, the, the G suit that, that you all wear, you called it a what? What's it called? So the newer one, um, you probably had the older one because we only switched uh, in probably like 2013 around that time frame. Um, so the older one had like the knee cutouts. Yeah. Um, so there was nothing covering that part. Um, the new one is more robust and it covers your entire leg. There's no gaps and it goes all the way up uh, your back to like right below your rib cage. And it wow. just provides a lot more G protection. So I think I forget what the exact numbers are, but it's like another G of protection that um, it provides over the legacy G suit. So they made everyone switch over. Because obviously the F-16 being a single seat aircraft, we've had some mishaps with Gs. Uh, so it's a high priority item. Um, but yeah, they're kind of a pain to put on, especially in front of a crowd when you're trying yeah. to do it quickly. Um, yeah. But they work really well. And I was definitely glad to have it when I was pulling eight to nine Gs at hundred feet above the ground. Now, how long do you sustain those, that amount of G and what maneuver is it that you're doing? Yeah. So the highest G profile in the entire um, flight for any of the positions is the left solo's max turn, which is the position I flew. Um, so that's just that 360 degree turn um, really showcasing how quickly the jet can turn around and it's flowing in full afterburner. Mm -hmm. So depending on the elevation of where we were flying. And I don't wanna to get too much into density altitude and all of that, but higher elevation, warmer temperatures, the engine doesn't perform as well. So that affects how fast you'd enter it. But I'm usually would be entering it around 400 knots to 430. Uh, and if you're on the faster side of that, you could definitely hit nine Gs initially, yep. but it honestly, you aren't sustaining nine all the way around. I don't want to do that. And the jet doesn't want to do that. And it honestly looks a little bit better to the crowd. If you enter at slightly slower airspeed yep. and you might hit eight and a half for just a couple seconds, yeah. and then you maintain like seven, seven and a half all the way around, and then just square it up at the end to get back on the show line. Um, it keeps the turn radius a little bit smaller. So you're closer to the crowd um, and it, it just looks better to them. And my body appreciates not sustaining over eight G's for more than a couple of seconds. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I'm glad you identified, you know, what, what your parameters were uh, for, for myself. Cause I, all fives do that on the blues. We do the, the MRT max maximum rate turn, right? It was always a technique item. Did you want to come in faster? Like you said, uh, you know, 400 knots, 430, and really pull it on and you get that bite. And uh, not only do you get the maximum G, but you know, the, the burners are hitting the crowd and that energy, um, or do you want more of a, but you're bleeding down quickly, right? Or do you want more of that sustained, beautiful, you know, turn? And that was a debate that every solo would have. Um, and here's the cool part about the blues. We didn't say you have to fly it this way. The lead solo could could do what he or she wanted to within that parameters as it looked good. Um, I typically wanted to come in fast. I, I just love the high G. And then, um, but then you gotta, you gotta 
ease off. Otherwise you bleed down too much and it looks like crap, right? So, um, and I love what you said at the end, square off that turn, you know, have the energy to make it look good at the end. So did, did you have the option to do what you wanted or was it just whatever the SOP said? Yeah. So the time that I was on the team was really a, like a transitional time for the team in general. And okay. we, especially with 2020 happening and us not hiring new pilots that year, which we haven't talked about yet, but yep. um, with the pandemic going on, we only did about, I think, six show sites that year instead of the normal, which is like 35 or more. Yep. So the people who 2020 was their first year on the team, normally they would take over as the instructors, right? The next yep. winter to hire and train the new people. And we just didn't feel like in good conscience, we could be like, here's six people that have gone to six show sites and haven't seen that many, you know, high elevation shows or shows with mountains like close to the show line or over water or whatever. They just don't have the depth of experience. So it was a high risk for the team to stay on the normal hiring cycle. So everyone stayed instead. So that's how I ended up doing three years. Um, but because of that, it gave us the winter training season when we're normally flying like a thousand flights in four months between everyone uh, to get everyone ready to go for a season. It gave us the time to really dig into our maneuvers and our show sequences and yeah. see how we can make them better because they hadn't been changed in a long time. Yeah. So we completely redid the shows, all of them. We changed the order of maneuvers. We added a few new maneuvers, took some old ones out. We condensed the dead time between maneuvers, yep. which people really love. We added more afterburner, which people love. Yep. Um, yeah, so that I think our boss, Thunderbird One, having the trust in everyone's experience at that point and just having the bandwidth to be able to dedicate to that, we were able to kind of like try a lot of things and change a lot of things to how we wanted them to be flowing. And honestly, I think the product that came out the backside is pretty awesome. We got such great feedback on my last season. Um, even for people that had been watching the team for you know 20 years, they were like, that demo I saw today was like the best I've ever seen. So it was pretty cool. It, it helps to have very experienced pilots in every yeah. position because you can fly a lot closer. You're yeah. a lot more stable. Um, but yeah, by the time I left, the the product that the team was putting out was just, just awesome. So I'm excited to see the new team this year and see what they do with it. Yeah. Well, you know, what you just mentioned is the idea of innovation. You know, uh, uh, you know I know you're going to be out there on the speaking circuit. We'll talk more about that. Um, but one of the things I like to talk about is use that analogy, and you can do it now, um, with how do you put a new maneuver in? You know, how do you innovate uh, when you also are, are, you know, flying the show, right? Um, so I'm kind of curious because we did that on the blues where it, um, it was always cool to put in a new maneuver. You wanted to, right? I mean, you know, as a pilot, we want to put in a new maneuver, but it's hard because the, you already have a sequence. You have rendezvous, you have a sequence. Um, you, you, you're, as you said, training the new pilots. So even, and by new, the second year people, right, are, are you know, training the new ones. And, and a lot of times you don't have that time that you all had, which is beautiful that you had that extra year. Uh, we did it though, um, on my year in 91, when I was the lead solo pilot transitioning from number six to five uh, and 92 was, would be the year. So the early 92, uh, Thumper and I, my opposing solo, we put in three new maneuvers uh, into the solo program, which rare, man, that is super rare to put something like that in. I'm kind of curious, what, what maneuvers did you come up with as a team? What, what did you change? Yeah, so a lot of them were on the diamond side. Um, as far as solo stuff, we kind of simplified our five ship show stuff, which we haven't even talked about, but we have no backup pilots to fly in the demo. So if someone is sick uh, or injured or whatever, and they can't fly, we'll fly what we call a five ship show. Yep. If it's someone from one Same through on four. Same on the blues too, okay, by the way, perfect. for the audience. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. yeah, a lot of people think we have like backup pilots in the closet, you know, ready to go that we can pull out and be like, all right, it's your time. But just the the lift that that would be to keep them current is yeah. pretty incredible. So um, that's not an option. So if it's someone in the diamond that's not there, other than the boss, we can talk about that separately, but you know, one of the wingmen or number four, um, they just fly an incomplete diamond. So we joke that it's the flying Dorito, but honestly <laughs> to the crowd, it's 
a lot of people don't even notice, which is pretty incredible that they don't realize that there's three aircraft instead of four, but it doesn't change the sequence of maneuvers. Yeah. Um, but if a solo is not there, it changes everything because we have very specific maneuvers that we each do individually and they're timed off of the diamond, they're timed off of each other. So we had all these different show sequences, depending on what the weather was going to allow us uh, to fly, whether it's a high show, a low show or a flat show, um, which all depends on obviously the ceiling height of the clouds. Uh, we'll always default to a high show if we can, yep. but you know, sometimes the weather doesn't allow. So we really cleaned that up and made them as similar as possible with timing that was as similar as possible because we found in my first year that, you know, especially if the other solo like breaks airborne last minute, you know, I think the one that really sticks out in my memory is he all of a sudden had a radio issue and communications are just so essential to the demo. He just couldn't safely fly uh, in the show and we were already airborne about to start. So he's just like, all right, I'll just be over here until you guys are done. <laughs> so I was not ready to fly a five ship show and we had practiced five ship shows a decent amount, but it was always the high show because that's the most likely going to happen. Oh. And it was a low weather day at minimums for our flat show. Whoa. So like the lowest the weather can get and we can still fly. And that was which, a hell. Which is what, what's your, what's your mins? So 2000 feet is the norm. Um, it can be waved down to 1500 feet if it's an experienced team or a show site that doesn't have a lot of obstacles. Um, so that's kind of at the boss's discretion, whether he's going to take it from 2000 to 1500, just depending on the demands of, uh, the show site specifics and the current team's proficiency. Okay. Um, yeah. And it was like, surprise, you're flying a five ship flat show, yeah. which I had possibly never done before, or maybe done once. And so trying to run those timing sequences and I'm like, I have a smart card on my knee that, you know, has the order and the timing, but having to actually look at that while you're flying the demo, because normally you don't look at it, you're memorized, like everything's memorized. It was very stressful. And we realized that just how different each of those were, was we were setting ourselves up for failure in that department. Yep. So we completely redid those, you know, added some new solo maneuvers. One of the really cool ones, um, when we reordered the show, uh, our crossover break, which I'm not sure what you guys call it, but it's a similar maneuver where you break cross, but same thing. Yep. Got it. The solos come from behind the crowd, pass overhead, and then yep. out in front, we point at each other and we cross. Yep. Um, so it looks, that's the first time the crowd sees the solos look like they're going to hit each other. So it always brings a lot of shock to people. Yes. Um, the reactions I was pretty good. Um, so we wanted to keep that timing the same, but you can't do that maneuver when there's only one of us. So we just added a straight up max climb from oh, nice. behind the crowd, like light the afterburner, yep. get super fast, go over the crowd at 500 feet, pull max G to vertical and just climb until you have to recover for the top of the airspace. Yep. People love it. Nice. It's such a simple maneuver to us. We're like, oh, that's not that big a deal. And it's really fun to fly, honestly, because it's not difficult, but it's, yep. it's super cool to fly over the crowd and actually see the people down there. And then just a few seconds later to recover from the maneuver and see that the little airfield's like a postage stamp. Yeah. Gives you some appreciation. 15,000 feet. I mean, what, what was your top 15? Yeah. 15,000 feet AGL. So above the ground. So yeah. depending on what the elevation was, but we had 15,000 feet of workable airspace. Yeah. Same. Yeah. I know. I agree with you that number six, number six flies it for the blues and it's, it's the double sneak. Actually, we do the sneak pass with five going down 50 feet off the ground in front. And that usually gets people's attention. And oh, yeah. then, you know, if we time it right, bam, you thump them. We call putting a hit on the crowd, right? Like you said, I used to love it. Point nose down, get in the airspeed and then 500 knots right over them. Then turn the burners on them, go straight up, um, hit the vertical rolls, whatever. But uh, I'm with you, man. Sometimes, you know, we're so focused. I can't wait to, to talk more. Um, that is one maneuver. You can really feel the crowd, right? And you can have a little fun. Oh yeah. And people love it so much. They're like, how can we put this in the show more often right. than, you know, just a five ship show. So we'll see if they, they do that this year at all, make any changes, but that that's one of them. And then the diamond, you know, they really added a lot more afterburner oh, uh, to their stuff because, you know, they're kind of known for just the close formation flying and being very graceful, but people love afterburner. Like that's, that's one of the things I just love about fighter aircraft. 
And so on our low and flat show now, uh, the solos do an opposing split S. So fly at each other, pass, each one goes uphill, rolls, and then pulls back down to have a second uh, knife edge hit at show center. So that's one of our favorite maneuvers. And it's kind of like the grand finale for the solos. But now what happens is solos hit and within about a second after that, the whole diamond in formation comes from behind the crowd oh, in, nice. in full AB. So they have their nice. speed brakes out so they don't go supersonic. Yeah. Uh, and they're in like a wider formation because obviously yeah. full afterburner, the jets are not as stable because they're going super fast. And with that being new this last season, people weren't expecting it. So to have a four full afterburner uh, aircraft sneak pass, essentially, well, yeah. <laughs> a lot That's of car, a great idea. A lot of car alarms are going off. A lot yeah. of babies cried. <laughs> exactly. Oh man. Okay. So I know you and I are, are we're in all the technical pilot pilot stuff, you know. Um, but I want to get back into some some big ideas, you know. Uh, but real quick on that is um we we put that maneuver in in 1991. I was actually you know, 1990, I was the uh seven, the narrator and Spurt and uh, Bush were the uh, opposing solo and lead solo. And we called it the vertical pitch. And, and uh, that's where just what you described, coming at each other, boom, you know, a roll, but split S, come back and then do the roll. And uh, I remember being in the solos, hanging out, listening to them as, as we were trying to develop that maneuver, right? Um, and it was cool. Uh, I'm glad you guys added the four plane uh, with the diamond over the top. That's cool. Hey, let's get back now to, I mean, we could talk maneuvers all the time, but yeah. uh, I want to get back into what's really in your heart and your soul and that kind of stuff. So uh, your second memory, what was it? So we, we touched on it a little bit. Uh, it was definitely the America strong flyovers that we did during the pandemic. Um, not necessarily one specific flight, okay. but the places that for, for a lot of reasons, the places we got to fly, like that'll never happen again to fly over the Hudson river past Manhattan at 500 feet, wow. you know, with, with both deltas, both the Thunderbirds and the blue angels flying formation together, which just doesn't really happen to fly, you know, a 270 degree turn around downtown Atlanta. We flew over the international airport in, in Atlanta. We flew over JFK airport. We flew over Denver international, like, at 500 feet in formation with smoke on that stuff just never will happen again because the commercial traffic that like it's it's just unheard of and so that was crazy it was surreal yeah another reason it really stands out is the flying was the hardest I did when I was on the team which people are shocked at every time um and we can talk about why that is and then the third reason was the impact that it left was incredible it it was tough for us as a team to logistically do that, to go travel across the country, to leave our families when all our kids were in school. And, you know, there's a lot of unknowns with the pandemic and we feel like we're putting the team at risk by traveling and staying in hotels and all that stuff. And a lot of restaurants are like all the logistics were just kind of a nightmare. Um, and like I said, the flying was hard, but then you land from a flight and you open your social media and you have like all these message requests and you're like, Oh, what are these from? And it's a nurse or a doctor or someone whose dad is a veteran and in like a VA home oh, and wow. got to go outside and see the jets fly over. Or someone sent me a video of their kids in their backyard who had been out of school for, I don't know, four to six weeks at that point, hadn't seen any of their friends and they're just outside like screaming in excitement as all uh, 12 jets go overhead. And so it just inspired a lot of people that were struggling with a lot of things at that time. And it really exposed both teams to a ton of people who would never go to an air show. So it was super cool because we got to spread like patriotism and inspiration and all this stuff. Uh, and it was tough for us. So to have that reward kind of at the end, it just left a big impact on all of us for sure. Wow. I'm so glad you uh, mentioned that. I, I think back to, you know, my time on the team, it, it really wasn't the flying and maneuvers. They're challenging. And, you know, we're, we're, we're joking back and forth about that, but it was always the impact you had on, on the crowd. Right. And the little kids, when you get to sign autographs and, and I just want to thank you and all the teams uh, people on the team for doing that during a time in our country 
where that inspiration was so needed. I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and I wasn't even part of the team then. And it talked about how memorable and how important that was, especially as a healthcare provider, you know, and all the challenges they've been at. So um, how did you, how did you all tell me just a little bit about the preparation of flying with the blues and the Thunderbirds? Cause you know, that's not normally done. Uh, so tell me a little bit about the inside. Was it easy? Was it hard? How did you decide who was leading? What was the, you know, give me the inside scoop. Yeah, there was a lot that went into it. Um, the teams worked really well together. So that was, that part was easy. It was just a big logistical lift and it was everything from getting tanker support for air refueling that can work with both aircraft right? Right. to getting approval by higher headquarters on the Air Force side and the Navy side. So those like timelines would just not line up for us. Um, so a lot of people had to get buy-in before we were able to do this. Um, the logistics of reaching out to all the different FAA agencies and all the different airports we were going to fly over and just making sure that they were aware that we were going to be bringing this train that can't really leave the tracks, you know, like anyone that happens to be flying general aviation aircraft, like we need them to be cleared out during that time. Um, obviously there weren't a ton of people doing that then with the pandemic going on, but there were still a few. So we had to, we had to make sure that was taken care of for safety reasons. Um, mapping out the route, like what, what are we going to try to fly over? Are we going to try to fly over downtown? Are we going to try to fly over hospitals? If we advertise this in advance, are people going to congregate in big groups, which yeah. is a thing we're told to not have people do, right? right. Like we, that's not our goal. Like we don't want to make things worse. So that was a thing. So the public affairs side of it was a big lift. Um, yeah, so there was just a ton. And then you get into kind of like the nitty gritty, actually hands-on flying, um, those logistics. We actually took our whole team and went to Pensacola and we were there for, I think th almost three weeks. Really? Um, that long? Yeah. So I think I have to try to remember the exact days. We were supposed to be there something like a week or 10 days. Like that was what we had planned for. Those yep. are the dates everyone was counting on. But I mean, stuff just flights kept getting pushed back for weather or oh. mostly for weather, but for all kinds of different reasons. So it'd be like, okay, we were supposed to do, you know, Baltimore, DC, whatever on this date. Um, we're waiting on this approval from the FAA. So it's going to have mm. to slip to the right. It's going to have to move later. Uh, now it looks like the weather is going to be socked in from 2000 feet to 30,000 feet. And we have to air refuel like three times. That's, it's just not worth that risk with two full Delta formations trying to make that happen. So we, we really wanted to be clear out when we did this, obviously we can refuel in the weather, but with how complicated this was, two different branches, multiple aircraft, uh, trying to fly in formation, we really wanted to set ourselves up for success as much as we could. Yeah. Um, so yeah, stuff just kept getting delayed and we ended up being there for almost three weeks. Wow. Uh, but we were set up in your squadron up in, up in the conference room, yeah. um, bumming Wi-Fi hotspots off of everyone's cell phones, like on our personal laptops, trying to draw routes, trying to map out smoke because we realized we didn't have enough smoke to cover all the areas we wanted oh, to. Oh yeah, of course. So, I mean, it works fine during a demo for maneuvers, but when you're flying low level for hundreds of miles, we were like, oh, we're going to run out of smoke. Yep. So we had to map out the entire thing. We had to map out all the obstacles. You know, where are those 500 foot tall towers that are in, you know, major metropolitan areas? We need to make sure the bosses see those. And again, who's going to lead, who's, yeah. which Delta is going to be out front and what airspeed are we going to fly? Yep. The F-18 flies better slower. The F-16 flies better faster. We need to meet somewhere in the middle yep. and there was just a lot of things to iron out. <laughs> wow. So cool. I mean, we go into more detail. I just had a thought, uh, by the way, I see the, your helmet behind you. Uh, so I got mine right here. Reach behind and grab your helmet if you could. All right, cool. Don't drop it. No. And so everybody, the ones that are watching this, uh, okay. Show us, show us the front of the helmet first. So you got, you know, everyone who's watching this on YouTube, this is pretty cool. You got a Thunderbird helmet and a Blue Angel helmet. Okay, both of them have the visors, right? You want to show us, Mace, how your visor works? Yeah, so this is old school. Um, yeah. The combat squadrons do not use that system, but this is it's kind of finicky as it can be. This really locks the visor down, which is important for the really aggressive maneuvering that we're doing. 
Now look how cool you get your call sign on the front of your visor. Yeah. We don't do that on the blues. We just have the blues. So, uh, and look at five is upside down. Tell yes. us why is the five upside down? Yeah. So that's probably the second most common question I get after getting asked if I land on a boat um, is why is the five upside down? And it's because the lead solo. So the number five position is always inverted for the two ship maneuvers. Uh, like, our reflection or calypso, which is one jet upside down and one right side up. Um, it's always the more experienced person. So number five, the lead solo. That way the number's right side up when you fly past the crowd. Yeah, that's so cool. I like, that. okay, flip it around, show the back of your helmet and tell yeah. me now, so we got the crest, we call it a crest. What do you guys call your patch? What do you call it? We, we literally call it the patch. The patch, there you go, okay. And it's the patch, right? That's what you say? Is, is that different than any other fleet squad or, you know, gun squadron patch? I mean, as far as calling them the patch, you kind of, you know what I'm yeah. asking? Yeah. So I would say our patch is kind of like patch with a capital P where right. in other squadrons you're like, oh, the squadron patch, it's just what's on your uniform. Got it. And it's not something that's, I mean, it's something everyone wears, but it's not something that's given that much emphasis right. uh, on the team getting the patch is given a ton of emphasis and um we actually have patch ceremonies for everyone that's new to the team both officers yes. and enlisted and the boss stands up there and talks about you know that this brand this logo and everything it represents and the team's been around since 1953 people have lost their lives like there's a lot that goes uh, behind this and that it stands for. And so he really wants to impart on people the responsibility that they're taking on when they're given the patch to wear. Yeah. And people ask all the time for us to exchange patches or <laughs> to send them a patch. And it's any other squadron that's totally a common practice, but it's just not something we do. We actually sew them onto our uniforms instead of just using Velcro uh, for that very reason. It's something that's kind of earned and only people that are actually on the team um, I guess, have the privilege of wearing them. Absolutely. Blue Angels, the like, same thing. And, uh, you know, here's my call sign. So ours is in the back. Yours is up front there. Um, let's do this real quick. Well, I, I'm curious, um, how do you describe, you said the boss describes the essence behind the patch. How do you describe it? Yeah, it's, it's really quite the legacy that goes behind it. I mean, almost 70 years, um, it's really crazy stories, you know, of kind of back in the days when it was the Wild West and the team was just trying things and seeing what worked, seeing what didn't. Um, some things had tragic ends and some things were great successes. And so there's just so much history there. And we have a Thunderbird uh, alumni reunion every couple of years at Nellis, which is here in Las Vegas. We actually just had one this past November. And you have people there that are, you know, in their 90s who were on the team in some form. And you have people that went on to be four-star generals or chiefs of staff of the Air Force uh, to do all kinds of other great things outside the military. And knowing that all of those people are there watching the current team fly yeah. with the same patch, the same colors, it represents the same thing. Like, that's a lot of weight on your shoulders. Like of all the shows, the alumni show is yeah. probably the one you want to go the best of the entire season. Yeah. You know, all of those people want you to accurately represent, you know, what the brand stands for. That's beautiful. We just had our end of season uh, a, a reunion, but it was the 75th. So you can imagine it was a big deal, right? How, how everybody came back. And uh, that was just in Pensacola this November, right? And I know that was one of your last flight on the Thunderbirds was when? Yeah, so my last actual demonstration show for a crowd was for the alumni and that was in November. And then I actually had what we call our Finney flight, which is your last flight in the aircraft uh, in that squadron. I had that back the first week of December. So uh, only about six weeks ago, it already feels like forever ago, but <laughs> it was very recent. <laughs> Oh, I didn't know. So you, our last flight is the demo. That's it. That's you're, you're done. We have uh, the transition that evening and you're done. So you guys do it differently. What do you do? Yeah. So that's, this is again, an interesting time to talk about that. And that's a great question because previously, um, like when I was hired to the team, there was quite a bit of overlap. The old team would stay and instruct and teach the new team, their replacements, their position till early January. Wow. So yeah, November to January, all of those flights were flown with, you know, in a, a two seat model with someone in the back seat or in, you know, a two jet formation. 
with a person that was about to leave the team. Wow. And one of the things that we started to think about after building the relationship with you guys was that you guys make that work safely without an overlap. Like, right. how is that possible? So we started to look at that because we realized that the identity of the new team really needs to start forming and they need to go through all the phases of creating a high-performing team yep. as fast as possible. And that's hard to do when you have, you know, like grandpa so-and-so on their third year who's there like critiquing everything. Um, so we really wanted to pass that lift of all that instruction to the second year experienced people um, who are going to continue to be on the team with those new people. So we drastically shortened that. And I was able, I still did some overlap uh, flights with the new solo and then also with um, the new left wingman, um, just being on the left side of the formation, I'm able to help with that some, uh, but it was quick. It was only a handful compared to probably over 50 before. And I think <sighs> I did maybe like 10 this time. And honestly, the team at the point in the training season they're at right now, they could get certified and go do a show like they look so good and it's happening so much earlier than it was with kind of the old construct so wow. we're we're pretty excited that it looks like it's working and that it was a good decision so yeah that's huge i just got goosebumps and uh uh and to see that you know that's the cool part is we learn from each other right the thunderbirds and the blues um you know uh, we we cherished that exchange time with you sitting in on the briefs and the debriefs and they're, you know, they're similar, but there's some slight differences and you learn. Right. And, uh, uh, that was, that's cool. I'm so glad that you guys, um, are adopting that. Um, I think there's some advantage too, to having some overlap. Uh, we don't do that on the blues. It's, it's, you're done, man. I mean, you're kicked out the door, uh, and, uh, you know, you don't wear the blue suit anymore. It's you're, you're, you're over, man. Uh, but the, uh, uh, to see you guys adopting that is huge. Hey, let's do something fun real quick. Sugar asked us our producer. And if you don't mind, I hate when people ask me to do this, but I'm going to do it anyhow. Let's at put least, our helmets on. Okay. At least it's not going to mess up your hair. Your hair that's true. <laughs> I know. I don't have to worry about that. Here let's see go. if it can keep my ear buds in. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Sweet. This isn't my normal hairstyle that I sport. It's not? Uh, okay. When wearing the helmet. All right. So let's do visors up first. Then we'll go visor down. All right, so Sugar, I know you're capturing this. All right, Mace and Gucci. All right, now Mace, let's go visor down. Then we get into the whole discussion of why we have a mask and you guys don't have a mask. Uh, we can do that real quick. All right, thumbs up. And look at Mace, you're wearing glad to be here. This is so damn yeah, cool. Right. We're going to talk about that. There you go. Sweet. Okay, let's, we got the shot. That's cool. Whatever. Um, Hey, uh, on that, first off, um, so a couple of things uh, while we're talking about glad to be here, you know, um, I don't know, did that come across uh, when you sat in on the Blue Angels debriefs as something unique? Do you, what, what came across to you with the glad to be here? Uh, yeah, we definitely noticed uh, that it was, you know, kind of the closing thing that yep. ends the entire brief. Uh, we have something that we do where we all hit the table in unison. And it's just kind of, I think yours is obviously, it explains it more because it's words, but they have similar kind of like team bonding effects, right? Um, it's easy to lose sight of why you're there and how cool what you're doing actually is when you're tired and it's in the middle of show season and what your back hurts, whatever it is. Um, so it's kind of a good reminder of the gratitude that you should have for the opportunity. Yeah, I, I love that. What is, um, so you guys, I, I know if I remember, it was that right at the end of the debrief and does the boss initiate it? Uh, take me through it. What's your, uh, bonding? What did you do? Yeah. So we kind of just go around, um, we Alice end whatever we're saying, um, it's kind of like almost saying over, like it's the next person's time to talk, but just with, by saying your number. So okay. I would like, when it got to me, I would be like, whatever I was going to say. And then I'd be like five and then six would do it. And he'd be like six. And once it's all done, the boss will just kind of like raise his fist, pause for a second, everyone will match. And then we all hit the table together. Bam. That's so, cool. How, how many times, how long does it take to get in perfect unison? Or does it change or do you get pretty much in the groove? 
I think you get in the groove, but then there's Alice a struggler that pops mm-hmm. up occasionally and we give them a hard time um, when they're early or late, uh, but it's just joking. It's all yeah. in good fun. Um, and you end up, you find that anytime the boss starts a conversation with everyone, even if it's not in a formal brief, you feel like you can't end it without being like, ah. you're just like, what do I do with my hands? I have, I have to do that. It becomes ingrained in you. Oh, I love it. It's like a trigger, right? And, uh, and the other trigger is your number. Isn't it funny how you get more associated with a number than your name? I, I always found that. What's the song? There's a classic song that um, talks about that. But I found that true on the team is people know you and you actually know yourself as a number because what that number represents. You know, we were talking about the opposing solo is always six, the lead solo is five. Um, uh, I don't know. I just, I find that interesting. How, how did you guys do it? Yeah, you definitely uh, become known by your number. The other pilots call you by your call signs generally, yeah. just because that's what we're used to. Yeah. Um, but everyone on the team, even on the enlisted side, will refer to you by your number pretty often, oh, which is different. I know. So there's a, definitely a different relationship uh, between officers and enlisted in the Air Force versus the Navy. Like, we noticed that working with the Blues. Yeah, tell um, me. And what, it's, what's the it's, difference? So I think it's more relaxed on the Air Force side oh, as is it, it is. It's, I think you guys kind of hold tradi- two traditions uh, harder than the Air Force does. Oh. And we're a little bit more casual. It doesn't take away the, the chain of command or the ability to, you know, to ask someone to do something or tell someone that they need to do something. They're like happy to do it. Right. Um, so I don't really think it breaks down the discipline. Um, which from an outsider's perspective could be seen, but it just makes the team really tight knit and like everyone just is happy to help support the mission and doesn't want to let people down. And it's, it's not a, like, I'm afraid of major so-and-so or Lieutenant Colonel so-and-so because they like rule with an iron fist and they outrank me. It's more of like, I don't want to disappoint dad, which I think it, it like just makes for a good atmosphere in the organization. Oh, that's so cool. You know, it's funny. I thought you were going to say the opposite. I thought you were going to say the blues are more relaxed because I feel, and this is what's cool about culture is I feel the blues are more relaxed. Well, the blues are more relaxed with our enlisted than in the fleet. When you're in a fleet squadron, you know, you don't call people by their first names. It's, you know, sir, ma'am, or, or their, their rank. Right. But in the blues, we actually drop that, you know, and a lot of it is first name or call sign, but it's interesting to hear that you, that it's even more relaxed in your so tell me like give me an example you're working with your plane captain or a maintenance person how would that interaction go that's different than the blues if it's different yeah so especially with your assigned crew chiefs you know you have your dedicated crew chief and your assistant dedicated crew chief that are with you the whole season so you get very close with them you know about their families you know when they're having a bad day they know the same with you which is it's really great because those conversations you have with them right before you start the jet or while you're launching the aircraft, uh, it just can really set your mood. So it's helpful to have someone you feel like you can confide in and it goes both ways. Um, So I think that's an even more unique relationship than just the general um, one between the officers and the enlisted, but it's super common for the E's to call the O's by their number. Like that's, that's very normal. We're normally, you know, the rank last name. Um, And then your dedicated crew chiefs are calling you by your call sign, um, which isn't happening really in most other Air Force squadrons. So I I really appreciate those relationships. And my last year on the team, I had uh, both my crew chiefs were women. So we had an all female- We had an all women's crew. And it was As number five. Yeah. Whoa. So that was cool. It was, it's just so cool. Cause they, you know, me being the only female pilot, there were certain things that, I struggled with and being a female maintainer, it's definitely a hard job. And so to have the ability to joke around and yeah. vent about that stuff and then the ability to go to the autograph line at the end of a show and be like, this is the whole five load team, all Whoa. three of us to like a little girl. They're just like, what? <laughs> Which oh. it was such a cool way to have an impact. That is so cool. Hey, so tell me what were some of the, the joys and challenges of being a woman 
on the Thunderbirds and let alone be in a solo, which by the way, I think there's only been five women, right? That have been solo or actually on the Thunderbirds period as 60, as the, as the demo pilots, right? So there's been five female pilots on the team. Um, I was the fifth. Um, one was the narrator. So she didn't fly in the demo, but she's still an F-16 pilot, went on to yep. be a squadron commander. Uh, she's super awesome. But so yeah, four of us that flew in the demo um, and then one other one before me, that was a, a solo. So I was the second female solo. Okay. Um, so she was a right solo. So people are like, you could be, you're the first female left solo. I was like, I feel like we're trying a little hard if we're yeah. quantifying yeah. it that much. Um, but yeah, we actually just hired another female pilot to be number three. So she's Great. in training right now and she's awesome. We actually went to college together, which is super really? random because I did not go to the Air Force Academy. Yeah. So uh, just really random that we both uh, went to a small private school up in Minnesota. And well, actually, I saw St. Thomas. I'm thinking you're in the Virgin Islands. Yeah, that's a trap. <laughs> okay. It's, it's really Minnesota. It's St. Paul, Minnesota. I think it was like negative 30 there a couple of days ago. Okay. Hey, yeah. um, so back to it, because I think it's just so cool to, um, you know, be a, a woman in the Air Force, number one, um, you know, give me the real scoop. Where's the opportunities? Uh, what did you find were, was the joy and what were some of the challenges being on the team and, and being a, you know, a female pilot? Yeah. So in the Air Force in general, uh, there's still not very many of us. And I know there's even fewer female fighter pilots in the Navy. I yep. think it's something like 3% in the Air Force of, fighter, yeah, of no fighter pilots are women. So I don't know what the exact numbers are today, but it's somewhere like 50 people. <laughs> like, so it's wow. not a lot. We, most of us know each other or know of each other because it's such a small group. Yeah. Um, but really in your average combat squadron, your calf squadron, it's, it's just not really a big deal. It's not a factor and it's gotten even less so in the last few years. Um, when I first went into a combat squadron, as far as flying, it wasn't a factor. Like briefs went the same, debriefs went the same, the jet doesn't care what gender you are, all of that. It was still a little bit of a cultural factor, I would say. That was kind of a transitional time. Um, 2010 to 2013, the Air Force went through a lot of efforts to kind of clean up the, I guess the reputation that fighter squadrons had of like a little bit of like a good old boys club type thing. Um, it was never blatant. It was just, you definitely felt a lot of eyes were on you and people felt like they were walking on eggshells a little bit until they really got to know you. So when you'd show up to a new squadron, you know, anytime uh -huh. anyone makes a joke or a comment or whatever it is, even if it's not directed at you, which they never were, uh, everyone's like, what's she going to think? Is right. this going to get me in trouble? And I'm as a brand new Lieutenant, who's still trying to figure out the jet and figure out the culture of a fighter squad in general, and like set your reputation in this world. It was just a lot of responsibility. You're like, why is it my job to decide what's acceptable in the squadron? Oh, that's great. Like, why does this weight fall on my shoulders to do that? So it took a while for me to get kind of comfortable and decide with, you know, what, cause you, you want to be just like everyone, you want to be cool with everyone. You don't want to be, yep. you know, causing problems, but at the same time, there'll be stuff that said that does make you uncomfortable. And so you're like, where do I draw that line? When am I going to speak up? When am I not? So that's just a lot of burden, I think, to bear for a young female pilot. Um, it became way less of a factor as I got older and more experienced in the aircraft and became an instructor and all that. I was just like, you know, whatever, I'm, you guys are dumb, but right? <laughs> you kind right. of just let it roll off and it's like, not that big a deal. And there was definitely a cultural shift as well, uh, where it just became less of a factor. So I've, I don't really have any like big negative experiences that stand out. It's just kind of those little things that, uh, that were there coming to now, the team. Me. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. I, that was my question. Now tell me about the team though. Is it, yeah. was there any nuance there? So the one difference for the team is our mission, right? So, so the mission is to recruit, retain, and inspire. So having someone flying a jet in front of the crowd that is not the norm is a benefit, Yeah. right? Sure. So I think when it comes to hiring, all the standards are the same. Like that's never the thing that makes the decision. 
but it's looked at as a benefit to the team. Yep. Absolutely. Because you can say it's not a big deal, but for little girls to look at the jets and then have them shut down and see the pilots walk out and see someone that looks like them yeah. is hugely impactful. Oh, I agree. It's a huge deal. It is a huge deal. And not just a woman, but, you know, also color and different races, right? I mean, we're absolutely, it all matters. Yeah, it does. And like I said, in any other squadron, it's not something that's really brought up that much or like, it's just not something that matters in day-to-day operations. But when your mission is to recruit, retain, and inspire people, it does matter. So that was the coolest part about being on the team was it, like you said, it was not the flying, even though that was pretty awesome. It was all of a sudden having this platform where I realized I could make a huge impact on people's lives and everyone on the team does that, but I definitely was under the spotlight a little bit more being the only female pilot. So I had a little bit more reach and got some attention wanted or not wanted that could impact people. So it it was a cool spot to be in for sure. Now in the selection process with the Thunderbirds, does Washington, not Washington, yeah. Does the chain of command get involved? How much is the team involved? Uh, on picking those new pilots? Yeah, so it really depends on who's in current leadership positions, but generally they're chosen by the current team. Um, So the boss may or may not get involved a certain amount. It depends on who that is. And sometimes they'll be like, all right, you guys can pick who's going to be on the team and bring it to me. And I will either be like, I agree, or I'll be like, I appreciate your efforts, but I think we should swap this person for this person, whatever. And then it's kind of the same as it goes up to the wing commander, who's a one-star general Mm -hmm. um, at Nellis. And again, the team will be like, this is who we would like for each position. This is who we recommend because we're the ones that do the job day to day. And we just hung out with all these people. So we feel like we have a little bit more knowledge on what their personalities are like and how they'll fit with everyone. Um, And then the wing commander can be like, yes or no and change it and then same all the way up to you know the commander of air combat command so ACC he is signs off on it eventually so they all are involved but generally they trust the actual operators at the lower level to make the decision so in your three years did did anybody not get accepted that you that the team wanted was there a switch out no I I didn't see it happen at all like honestly people would give their inputs beforehand be like you know okay this person was an exec and came super recommended by general whoever Mm -hmm. uh and we would take that into account but it really came down to the whole person package and you know how they act around everyone are they going to represent the team well and then their actual ability to complete the mission to fly or to do whatever job they had in the squadron i love it let me get back to some more personal stories as uh, and by the way, we could keep talking forever, but uh, yeah. I want to get into some really some heartfelt stuff. Uh, when you think about some of the interactions you had with kids or just people, right? I mean, we talked about the COVID flyovers and stuff. What are some of those that that just stick in your mind that right now are burned into your mind? Maybe it's a child's face. I don't know. What what is it for you? Yeah, there's there's a lot. Um, ones that specifically stick with me, the ones I mentioned about the COVID flyovers, uh, there was one person after those that sent me a message and it wasn't like right after we landed, it was a little bit while later. And her dad was a veteran and was in a VA home. So I kind of alluded to that a little bit, but she was able to go and take him outside for him to see the aircraft fly over. And like, he was just so excited about it. And then he ended up passing away very shortly after that. And so for her, I think that was a lot of closure to like know that she was able to provide him with that opportunity and see the joy on his face when it was such a dark time, especially for people in that position where they're kind of isolated. Um, so the message I got from her, I was like, whew, this, this is like really touching. Um, and I actually shared it with the whole squadron or with all of the pilots at least. And everyone was like, all right, that's why we did that. Um, and then I was on the team long enough that some interactions started to come full circle, um, which you rarely see when your goal is to recruit people uh, or inspire them, right? Like yeah. you might plant that seed and it might not come to fruition 
for 10 years or whatever it is. And you will probably never know that you're the catalyst that made them uh, make the decisions that they did. Uh, but especially with social media and kind of just growing the presence on there, it gave a lot of people the ability to just direct message me and have these interactions I wouldn't normally have. And there was a girl in 2019 that reached out and she was headed to pilot training. So she had just finished ROTC, oh, nice. got a pilot slot. Um, and she was like, she's like, I'm super nervous. I have zero flight time, like no general aviation experience. I was a non-technical major. I forget what her major was like history or something. Um, I'm headed to Columbus uh, Air Force Base. And she's like, I like, do you have any advice? I know pilot training is hard. Like, and I was like, I got you. I was a criminal justice major. I had zero flight time going into pilot training. And I actually went to Columbus for pilot training wow. as well. So I was like, you're me like 12 years ago or whatever at the time. Wow. And so I told her that which hopefully gave her a little boost of confidence. And then I told her like what worked for me, how I, how I balance things for stress, like study habits, you know, the relationships in your class and how those can help get through like the struggles of an intense training program. And that was it. She's like, okay, thanks. I appreciate it. I was like, cool. Did my job. You know, I messaged her back. That's great. And then my third year on the team, when I was supposed to be gone by then, I got another message from her. And she was like, I don't know if you remember me, but so I had to like scroll back to like jog my memory as to who it was. But she's like, I went to Columbus. Um, she's like, we just had our drop night and I'm going to fly the F-16. And I was like, this is awesome. And I mean, she did all that work, but yeah. to feel like I was directly able to impact her was awesome for me. And I was like, this is why I do this. This is why outside of work hours, I spend time responding to those messages. Yeah. Wow. It just brought tears to my eyes, you know, no kidding. I mean, to feel that impact that you had um, so powerful, so powerful. And I think that's what I know for me, what I, my lasting uh, impressions are, it was the impact. It was the people. Uh, one of the unique things I got to do in 92 is we took the team to Moscow, you know, mm -hmm. um, which was very unique, right? Yeah, Fly right. with the Russians. Oh man, that was probably so not cool. now, huh? <laughs> yeah, right. Speaking of today, but um, but you know, and at the end of the day, though, I, I will give you that we we flew with the demo teams, and it wasn't just you know the Thunderbirds and the Blues. You know, we're very similar for lots of ways, right? But what 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 I one of my big takeaways was as human beings, we're very similar with you know the Russian pilots. I mean, they wanted the same thing. There was there were very little different. I mean, yeah, we did this at first, and I, I took the uh, the hero of the Soviet Union in my back seat, knocked his butt out, you know, of course, airborne. Um, and uh, he tried to knock me out. He couldn't, but we had fun, right? But the point was, um, we did that. But then when we left the country, we're drinking vodka, we're arm in arm, we're playing guitars. And to me, that's the long-term message, whether it's today or anything, it's, it's we're all people, right? And we're all uh, deep down in the heart. And that's why I want to applaud you for reaching out uh, and being that inspiration for the little girls out there and, and not, and everyone too, and the little boys. In fact, let me ask you a question. Did you notice any difference? Uh, I know how, you know, a, a little girl can look at, at you and just go, that could be me. And you got the story of it, it was somebody, right? Did you notice anything in boys? Oh yeah, definitely. They, I mean, I think for any child meeting any demo pilot right after they land and they just saw them in their face, they're just like, this is hugely inspiring. Yeah. Uh, a lot of moms would bring their sons over in the autograph line. And I think, you know, being the lead solo is a unique position too, because yeah. you do stand out. Yeah. You have the upside down five. Uh, I grew my hair out by the end of the last season. So you could actually see my braid hanging out of the helmet when I was oh, inverted. Beautiful. Yeah, so that was cool. And the, these moms that would, or dads too, honestly, would drag their sons over and be like, that was her. Like, how awesome is that? And it might not be as blatant as it is for the little girls, but that still is impactful for the little boys to see a diverse group of people doing that. That's so cool. Yeah, and that's what's beautiful about our country too and everything, right? All right, let's talk real quick about the debrief and then um, we'll, we'll start to wrap on some, some uh, uh, heartfelt stuff again. Uh, tell me about the debrief. Uh, why is it important? And, and what was the nuance? Were there nuances between when you observed how the Blue Angels did a debrief and how you all debriefed? Yeah, so 
I think a, a lot of people think that, you know, we just fly the demo, sign autographs, and then we like go high five each other and go have a beer. But we debriefed every sortie all the way down to our last one that we flew, you know, at the end of a season. Yeah. Um, and for us, we would go through just admin stuff at the beginning, and then we would watch on video every single maneuver. And right before the maneuver played, um, whoever was in it would talk about anything they had. So if it went perfect, which it almost never does, you just say your number. Um, otherwise you'd be like, oh, you know, I was, we use the terms uh, TT and trip T in our uh, debrief and oh, TT. I didn't know this. Yeah, this is, this is weird. Cause when I was an applicant, I was like, what are they talking about? Um, TT means teeny tiny. Wow. This is, it's fine. And trip T is teeny, teeny, tiny. And so kind of the threshold is, um, what you say, like out, if you were just out of formation, yeah. uh, you would just say, you know, I was out on this maneuver or I was wide. And that means you were pretty wide. Like the whole crowd probably saw it. Right. Um, if you say I was TT wide, so teeny tiny wide, the only people that would really notice are people that watch, have seen the demo a lot of times, kind of a trained eye. Okay. And then trip T uh, deviations. The only people that are noticing those are us and maybe alumni who have flown in the positions. Yeah. Um, so it kind of sets the scale of how big of a deviation you had. So that's kind of a unique cultural thing. I like that. Um, but yeah, so I might be like, uh, the Delta roll was very difficult maneuver for me. Uh, flying yeah, because we're rolling wing. into five, right? Yes, yeah. yes. So for everybody that's not a pilot, and, and that's why, you know, as Mace keeps saying, I was the left outpost left wing that's the hardest position because the formation is rolling into you i remember the first time that i moved to um i was moving from six to five and we actually switch and i was actually in threes position or, or, or you know and your, your twos on the left right right Ours yeah opposite two. of yours yeah. a little bit opposite but i was actually in twos position and um your two i guess are three and that first time when the boss rolls into you um it was like eye-opening right and then you put yourself down on the end of the chain like you're saying, totally. I mean, it took me weeks to figure that out. I thought I was going to be the first lead solo pilot fired because you can't get the the Delta roll. I mean, it was super hard, but um, over to you. you were yeah, probably. I'm exactly what you just described. I'm glad we have the same feelings on that one. <laughs> That's like what everyone talks about when you get hired for the left side. They're like, those rolls, get ready for that. Because you have, you're, you know, you're too removed from the center of the axis yeah. and you have to push while yeah. rolling. It's very uncomfortable. Um, but we could talk forever about the challenges yeah. of the Delta roll, but in debrief, that was a maneuver I struggled with for probably my first half of my first season, you know, well into doing shows, I would see that I was making a deviation. It wasn't always noticeable to the crowd, but it was definitely noticeable to me and the other pilots. Um, so like right before the Delta role played, we'd go through each position and, you know, the boss might be like, I got, you know, TT knows high compared to what he's targeting or yeah, a little bit fast or whatever. And by the time it got to me, I'm like, yeah, TT deep over the top or aft or whatever it was. Um, and there's no hiding it, right? Like, right. even if I just said my number, we're going to watch the tapes and everyone's going to see it. So you just get very used to fessing up. And then we go through that portion for every maneuver, the playback. And then at the end, we kind of like break out into our smaller diamond and solos to talk about instructional fixes on how to fix the mistakes that we saw and how to do it better next time. Oh, you actually um, did that in the debrief? You broke out into diamond solos? At the very end, once like the formal, once we had gone through the entire demo with all of us, okay, um, then we would kind of do in-depth instruction to fix it kind of as the wrap up. Um, so we would do that in the brief. I don't know, you know, again, this is over time, right? I'm, I'm, I'm an old, old guy, right? I'm, I'm the nineties, right? Um, but we would, in the brief, we would do the Delta maneuvers and boss would go through the voice calls and all that kind of stuff. And then we would split up the diamond and solos for our, our maneuvers for the brief. But in the debrief, we, we just did everything as, as a, as a full team. Uh, so interesting. Go ahead. Yeah, we do both. Uh, we do that in both the brief and the debrief. Okay. Um, Good to know it just to be able whoever the diamond instructor pilot is so there's usually the experienced person yeah. uh usually in the number four spot because yeah. he gets to look forward and see what's going on yeah. um so he would instruct the wingman on mistakes they had made or whatever and then um the lead solo would kind of run 
the brief to talk about like things that went wrong last time and be like, you know, remember our tendency, our trend on this maneuver has been for whatever to happen. This is how we need to fix that. And then kind of similar in the debrief. Now we're like, did we successfully do that? Like, cool. Like we, we figured it out. Now we just need to repeat that. Yeah. Um, or we, I always called it a game of whack-a-mole. Like there's always some mistake that's popping up. You know, you might fly one maneuver perfectly the show before. And then the next show, you just like totally mess it, not like drastically mess it up, but to the point where you're not happy with your performance. You're like, what changed? I was nailing that yesterday. Why am I not nailing it today? So I think that kind of shows the high level of performance you're operating on like or at that that tends to happen um but yeah the debriefs they're a little bit different because i've sat in on a couple of blues uh briefs and debriefs but honestly they're the atmosphere is the same the points you're hitting are the same it's kind of structured the same um and the overall culture of it and the overall goal of it is the same between the two i love that um let's uh by the way i wanted to acknowledge i know b- before we went live uh that picture behind you the f-16 you said uh you, it was your wedding picture and you yeah. changed it for the like yeah let me see your wedding picture i'd, I'd rather that, there we go oh cool <laughs> right oh. so that normally hangs up there um i'm in my temporary <laughs> office in our dining room so <laughs> i don't have jet stuff hanging in my dining room yeah uh, it normally lives in the other office which my husband's using right now so i oh. set up this backdrop you know, be on brand for this interview. That's awesome. And I love what you said, Mace, is, you know, this is like my backdrop, but that's it. There's no fighter pilot. There's no Blue Angel stuff anywhere else in the house, okay? Because my wife's like, no, you know, <laughs> and I agree with that, by the way. I, um, that's kind of cool. That's good. Yeah, hey, absolutely. <laughs> give me now some, uh, as I'm wrapping, uh, I'm actually going to Flip any question over to you that you wish we had talked about or you want to talk about. There's just so many. Um, anything that you think would be really interesting for our audience or that you want to know? I think we hit all the high points between the two. T- it's just endless stuff. <laughs> but I can't think of any questions specifically off the top of my head. How about this one? I'll go with this then. What are your biggest takeaways? Uh, and by the way, you just left the team. Uh, so I, I know these will continue to build. But um, what did you learn from the experience you had on the Thunderbirds, but really the whole Air Force, um, but let's say specifically the Thunderbirds, that you want to share with the rest of the world? Cool. The, there's a lot. Uh, there's definitely like some professional ones out there just about kind of the debrief culture. And I think a lot of really quality things that you can take from your time as a fighter pilot and especially on a demo team. Um, and transition them into whatever you do after that. Um, I think that area lacks a little bit in a lot of civilian organizations. Um, uh, just the ability to, you know, learn the lessons, figure out how to fix them, and then get stuff done <laughs> and better than you did it the last time. Um, so there's that. But then personally, I think I learned a lot about just the having perspective on stuff. And, and there were some days on the road in the demo, I dealt with some back pain while I was on the team. I still am, but there are some days, you know, far into the show seasons where you're tired and hot and my back was hurting. And I was like, I don't want to be here right now doing this. And it's so easy to lose perspective on the impact you're having and how much of a privilege it is to be in that position. And I think that that's something that I'll continue to have uh, appreciation for that will grow as I'm further removed. Um, And also the caliber of people that you get to work with in those roles is pretty incredible to have, especially on a demo team in the military in general and in the fighter culture in general. But then it's even elevated higher when you get to a demo team where you're looking for people that can not only fly the jet well, but also that are willing to put in the time and support the missions that the teams have specifically. And I'm sure I'm about to find out on the civilian side that not every organization has the honor of working with that caliber of people. So I know that's kind of a lot of answers for the one question, but those are the the big things. And I mean, ask me five years from now, I'm sure it'll change a little bit, but I think those are it for now. 
Wow. I, um, I just want to echo some of your uh, insights. And that is, yeah, the debrief process and, and what we've learned and how it's unique um, really is useful and helpful. By, by the way, not just in companies, but in families and in life, you know, sitting around the tables, right? So, um, and that continuous improvement, the, the, to surround yourself with people who really care, they're on the mission, and we're always trying to get better. You know, uh, I like what you brought up, uh, the the TT and the triple T, did you call it? Trip T. <laughs> Trip T, yeah. Um, you know, it's funny, most people just think, oh, that was a great show. And yet we on the inside go, well, you know, um, we can be a lot better, right? So, uh, but it was the more that personal connection of being with the people. Uh, I know it's a, that's what still reminds me. Hey, I want to um, wrap with a, a glad to be here statement. We call it a glad to be here share out on this podcast. And uh, it's very simply, um, what are you grateful for right now? What, why are you glad to be here? I am really grateful right now. Actually, I'm in the midst of transitioning from active duty Air Force and leaving the Thunderbirds at the same time uh, into a whole new adventure. And I am glad for all of the experiences that the Air Force gave me to give me the skills and experience that I have to take under my next chapter um, and all the friendships I made there. And then I'm very grateful for the time I have with my family right now, because that's a sacrifice you make in the military and especially with uh, show season schedules. So I am just super glad to have the time with them, the quality time, the flexibility um, with my husband, with my stepson. Uh, yeah. And I am very grateful for the opportunities that are coming around the corner um, in the next couple of years. So I am glad to be here. Awesome. I just want to say, Mace, Oh, by the way, I never asked you, how'd you get your call sign? I mean, I can only tell you that over a beer. Okay. So I don't know if Zoom counts, but. Uh, it's, it, well, we always say there's sometimes two call signs. There's the ones you can say in public and then there's our stories. And then there's the real one over to you. Uh, yeah, mine's actually very uh, PC and safe for mom or grandma or whoever. Um, it's a pretty heavy on pilot jargon, but it is an acronym and it basically tells a story about how I broke the speed of sound uh, while dogfighting. Uh, oh. So yeah, I was a young lieutenant in Northern Japan with a stronger ah. engine than I had learned to fly with. And ah. in December, it's very cold. Yeah. Turns out you cannot just light the afterburner and leave it there. The yeah. jet will in fact go supersonic. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's the the cliff notes of the story behind it. Oh, that's perfect. I'm glad you were, you were throttles up. Uh, that's so cool. Burners on. Um, yeah, I, I want to end with Glad Beer. Thank you uh, for this time together. It was just so much fun. I can't wait for people to listen to this, including myself. I'm going to re-listen to it. Um, and the, just the interaction we had. Uh, I learned a lot. You know, I mean, even though I've interacted with the Thunderbirds a lot, we're constantly learning from each other. Um, it was so cool to, uh, to share the stories and the meanings of the heart and so excited about your future. You know, there's so much you have to share with the world uh, and uh, super, super excited about that. So thanks for being on the High Performance Zone. Uh, we'll definitely stay in touch. I'll help you any way I can. Um, glad to be here, Mace. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it.